All right, welcome to Dr. Nick Sabicki's Music Production Secrets. Uh, today we're going to continue our uh, discussion on acoustics and how sound works, as you can see from our little title on the notepad there. Uh, but today, in particular, I want to focus on what happens when sound encounters a change in medium. In other words, uh, last few sessions we've talked about how you know we have this air molecule, right, and it'll hit some other air molecules. Um, what happens if it hits a whole different type of molecule? Let's get our blue here. All right, what if it hits, you know, maybe a wall, in other words? Well, there's really three things that can happen to this energy. Uh, the first is, let me make some more air molecules here for demonstration, is called transmission. All right, so I just made the sound, maybe it was pop, right, and it bumped into this air molecule, and this air molecule, and this air molecule hits a wall. So transmission means nothing happens. In other words, everything just keeps going on as if it did, right? The sound hits this air molecule, and it bounces there, and it bounces there, and it passes along the energy through the wall. You guys all know about transmission because at some point you probably had a noisy neighbor or roommate uh, who liked to play music a little bit too loud and went through your wall. This is what's happening, okay? So some of the energy, when it encounters a change in medium, will be transmitted through the wall or through whatever it is, okay? Next thing that can happen is it can reflect. And this is where acoustics really starts to become really cool uh, in figuring out you know, what part of the sound will reflect, how much will reflect. Uh, this is what acousticians spend a lot of their time actually figuring out. Okay, so this molecule will bounce into this one, bounce into this one, and then instead of being transmitted, well, some of the energy might be transmitted, but some more of the energy, let's use purple, will actually bounce off here, maybe go hit different air molecules, or even back at the same air molecule, right? It'll bounce here and bounce back. And that energy will keep going now in the opposite direction. That's supposed to be an arrow. Okay, so we have we have reflection, I should say, reflection, not just, well, use transmission, reflection, number three. Uh, the third thing is going to surprise you. And if you think about it, it's kind of necessary. Make that R look a little bit more like an R. Here's the th here's the scenario, right? We have this energy. I made a sound. I mean, boop, right? And it went bop, 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 bouncing on all these air molecules. Some of it will go through the wall and annoy my neighbor. Some of it will reflect back into the room. But all this means is that the sound is never going to die, right? You guys remember like Newton's laws of motion: object tends, you know, stays in motion, and then conserva conservation of energy. We can't create or destroy energy. So every time I make a sound, I'm adding new energy to the room, right? And in theory, the sound will never die, right? We should still be hearing like the voices of like John Lennon and Gandhi still speaking throughout our world, right? Because obviously at some point, John Lennon or Gandhi or, you know, Hitler, somebody said something, right? And moved one air, one air molecule, which moved another one, which moved another one. And maybe some of those air molecules got reflected and went that way. And some of the air molecules went through and became, you know, wall molecules essentially and kept going. And it kept maybe cycling around the earth, right? The, air, the That energy should still be here. But it's not, right? We still don't hear, we don't occasionally just like wake up from sleep and then hear like Gandhi talking to us. That doesn't happen. And the reason is because this third thing, the energy can also be absorbed. And this might seem counterintuitive because, or absorption, I guess we should be consistent with our three things that can happen to sound. Uh, so absorption, I think I spelled that right, right? I'm pretty sure. I have a doctorate. I should know how to spell absorption, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so if that's not how you spell it, then... I'm a doctor, trust me. Uh, so absorption seems weird though, right? I just told you you can't create or destroy energy. So when it gets absorbed, where does it go? Well, it actually gets transformed. And in this case, it gets transformed into heat. And this is just like what happens when we absorb light, right? When you absorb light with your body, it heats you up, it warms you up. All right, so light becomes heat as well. So same thing with sound. Whenever you make a sound and it hits any surface, or sometimes it's even in the air by itself, some of it will continue going, some of it will reflect, and some of it will be absorbed. Now, you go, you know, some of you out there might be going, duh, you know, we know this, we don't care. Some others of you might be saying, uh, all right, we didn't know that before, that's cool, but so what? Uh, well, the amount that gets transmitted, reflected, or absorbed is very dependent on the, the surface material. And in general, and this isn't this isn't a this is a general rule, but it does change depending on the material. Uh, the more um, we'll say solid and flat the surface, so the more mass it has and the flatter it is. So let's say you have this giant I don't know sheet metal thing here. Actually, metal isn't actually 
I shouldn't use metal as an example, that's a bad example. Let's say giant stone block. That's probably a good example. When sound hits this, uh, when it's really solid and really flat, more of it is likely to reflect and then be absorbed or transmitted. Okay, so we're going to see from a giant stone, lots of reflection. If something is really porous and, you know, has less mass, and think if you've ever been in a recording studio before, think of that studio foam that they have lining the walls, including, you know, my studio and the studio I run at the college and, you know, all, all those studios have, you know, these giant foam panels and they'll be, they'll have like weird shapes in them, like triangles and jagged edges and blocks and squares and things. Well, material like that, more of the sound is actually going to be uh, either transmitted or absorbed. And hopefully a lot of it gets absorbed because, uh, you know, often if you're working in a, in a studio environment, you don't want the sound to be leaking through the, the other walls as well. Okay, so the material will determine how much of these things happen. Now, it's not just the entire sound will get transmitted or reflected. These materials will also be very dependent on frequency. It all comes back to frequency. And in general, we're going to see high frequencies like to be absorbed and reflected. And lower frequencies really like to be transmitted. And you know this because, again, that noisy neighbor that you had, you know, when you were sharing an apartment or a roommate or whatever it was, uh, whenever when they were playing music that was too loud and it was going through your wall, the part that you heard of that music was just the bass, right? It was just the low frequencies. That was the only part of the music that made it through the wall. The part that was reflected and absorbed, you never got to hear, right? Because it was reflected to go back into that, you know, crappy roommate's room. And if it was absorbed, you know, neither one of you would have would have heard it. Okay, so uh, low frequencies like to transmit. High frequencies like to reflect and absorb. Okay, so let's say you're setting up a studio or a recording space or a listening space. How does this information affect you? Well, number one, depending on what you want to record, if you want a really, really pure recording, and that's not always a good thing, and we can talk about why, but let's say you want to adjust the exact sound as it was made without any sound of the room in your recording. When I say sound of the room, I mean the reflected space and surfaces of the room will contribute to that sound. Well, that means you need a whole lot of these foam panels and deadening kind of things and sofas and bookshelves and basically things that will either uh, absorb the sound or allow it to transmit really easily. And sometimes you might even use things that will reflect it, but in weird directions so it doesn't come right back at the microphone or wherever it is. If, on the other hand, you're trying to design a studio space that, uh, in, that has a little bit of a liveness to it, that sounds like the musician is really performing in front of a crowd or a space or, or uh, you know, just... just um, think of those great cathedrals, especially in Europe, where if you have a choir sing, the note will just hang in the air and suspend forever, um, you know, making the sound sound really full and warm, very wet is what we call it in the, in the industry. Uh, you want to you um, build your space with a lot of materials that are very good at reflections. And there's a lot of gradation in between. You don't ha your choices aren't, you know, just between what we call an anechoic chamber and a choic, again, I have a doctorate, I should know how to spell that. An anechoic chamber versus a cathedral hall, right? These are not your only options. There's a lot of gray area in between. Um, anechoic chamber, by the way, in case you haven't figured it out, basically means a room with no reflections, no echoes, uh, completely absorptive kind of space. Um, there's a lot of gradations, and a lot of famous studios will have their own sound uh, as part of them. But in general, I'll say for, you know, Whenever you're in doubt, uh, if you're if you're setting up your first studio or maybe you're even experienced studio, you know, when in doubt, it's probably better to absorb than it is to reflect. <laughs> um, if you don't know what to do, because this will this will create less frequency problems. Okay, new question. Okay, so you know, there's good reflections and bad reflections, right? We saw that the cathedral was often quoted as an example of having like really nice, long, pure, you know, clean reflections that are just great. What makes them so good though, is that if you think about the in interior of a cathedral, there's a lot of just, I'll say just random crap inside a cathedral. You know, you might have these w weird angled arches and like statues. Here's a statue of an angel or something, maybe an altar. There's, uh, you know, some stained glass and windows and, I don't know, this is bad. <laughs> Maybe there's some sort of, like, giant cross or something on the board. If uh, you've never been to a church or a cathedral before, that's fine. 
and uh, you got all this crap basically in the cathedral. Forgive me for calling it crap if you're <laughs> religiously offended. But what I mean by that is basically just a bunch of stuff that's that's going to reflect the sound in a bunch of weird ways. And those weird angles and weird ways are actually really good for the sound. One of the worst things you can have happen is to have a setup where you have two parallel walls. And then you make a sound. Whoops. And what happens to the sound is it'll go over here and it'll bounce off this wall and it'll reflect, especially if these walls are highly reflective, right? And it'll go over here and it'll bounce off this wall. And then it'll go over here and it'll bounce off this wall. And it'll go over here and bounce off this wall. And it'll go over here and bounce off this wall. Uh, do you guys see what's happening here? We just formed this cycle, this loop, right? Right? It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And in reality, right, if you were to listen to this sound, and you can do this wherever you have parallel walls. At the college, we have a great little spot next to the recording studios where you have these two giant parallel walls that are just, you know, six feet apart and just do this magnificently. Um, but if you were to go listen to this sound bounce back and forth, uh, what you'll actually hear is a frequency. And you should say, what? Why do you hear a frequency? Well, what is our definition of a frequency? If you remember from a few earlier, from a few videos back, right, we just talked about how often does that air molecule get pushed? Well, if it's consistent, we form a consistent frequency. And that's exactly what's happening here, right? Pretend there's an air molecule here that keeps getting bounced back and forth, right? It's now vibrating with a frequency, right? It's going back and forth so many times a second. And, uh, you know, I... Right now, I don't have. I wish I was kind of making this video at the college, and I would actually go get, just go grab a video camera and, and show you what happens uh, when you make a sound in between these two walls. But uh, for right now, I can actually simulate this effect inside of Cubase. So let's do that. All right. So here we are in Cubase, and I've got this drum kit loaded. Oh, let's uh, turn that off for a moment. That'll be a nice sound. I'm gonna use a snare drum sound for that. Hopefully, you can hear this. I can. Let me turn up a little bit. Okay, that should be loud enough to hear it, I think. And uh, you can hear I have the snare drum. It's got lots of different frequencies in it. It basically sounds like noise, and noise is really just all frequencies combined. And here's what I'm going to do. In order to simulate having parallel walls, all I have to do is use a delay plugin to take that sound, delay it, play it again, delay it, play it again. And all delay plugins will do that with a control called feedback. In other words, it's going to take a little bit of the output and feed it back into the input and do it again and again and again. So just here's the, here's the sound again. I'm just going to keep playing it. Actually, you know what I should do? I should actually uh, just make a little loop here so I don't have to keep playing it with my finger. So let's go over here. And we'll just drop in oh, this note. There we go. I'll go back out here. Set my locators. Use a slash key or hit that to loop it. We'll make a shorter loop. All right, so it's going to keep playing that exact sound over and over and over again. All right, and as I up the feedback, I'm basically adding uh, more and more um, reflectivity to the walls. Here, let's turn it on and listen. Already, you can hear it now. It has a pitch. It has a note to it. It has a frequency. Well, watch what happens. I turn this up. All right, let's stop. That's getting annoying. Hopefully, I didn't blast anyone out of their system. And maybe I, it's really hard to tell if I turned that up too loud or not. Uh, actually, I should just check that, shouldn't I? Well, let's not do it now. I'll do that on my own time, not your YouTube watching time. All right, so I just uh, basically simulated what happens when a sound is in between two walls, right? You have a sound, it goes back and forth, and it keeps uh, feeding back onto itself, essentially. It keeps vibrating the same molecule back and forth. Did that sound good? Well, that's a matter of taste, but if you're recording a vocalist in this space, I don't want to add these extra notes to the vocalist that, that he or she is not singing in the first place, right? This is a terrible idea. Uh, what I really want to have happen is for my vocalist to be completely in balance with the room. In other words, no frequencies are going to get amplified or resonated, and that's not what's happening here in this sort of space. So if you go into a recording space or are setting one up for yourself, uh, try to avoid any sort of parallel surfaces as much as possible. This is pretty much a given rule. And, you know, 
you know, I certainly set up my own studio this way, um, but all the college studios we try to set up is that way as well. Uh, if you if you guys are um, ever, you know, looking, we'll say at a at a professional recording studio, you might even see to the point where the windows are not actually square to the walls. Um, I know our windows are not. We actually have double pane windows that are more trapezoidal in terms of their angles, and we'll have giant pyramid structures on the walls that are. Uh, basically going to reflect sound in all different directions when it hits it. Um, these are called diffusers, uh, and this is why, okay, trying to avoid all of these parallel surfaces. I'm going to highlight this in this reddish color. Just to don't do parallel walls. Parallel walls, bad, okay? If you get anything from this video, uh, I guess you can get two things, okay? Take away, when sound encounters a change in medium, know that three things will happen. Here are the three things. If you remember, transmission, reflection, absorption can't even read them anymore. I've scribbled over them too many times. Uh, but the other thing is parallel walls, bad. You can say it like a zombie too. Just be parallel walls, bad. Okay. All right. Next video, we're going to talk a little bit about the harmonic series and overtones. And we're actually going to see one of the reasons why music sounds good. Actually, maybe not one reason, probably the reason why music sounds good, uh, which I think no one will want to miss. Okay. See you then.